sun is out, absolutely. So we're in Ohio, that is a big, 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 big deal. So I am excited as I can be, not only that we have Belle here today, but also that the sun is shining and you guys have all decided to join us. My name is Wendy Smooth. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and a faculty affiliate with the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. As you know, it's the Kerwin Institute that has invited you here this morning um, to share with us and to share with Belle. Um, Belle is here as a part of a residency that's been going on for the entire year. Um, we had two weeks with her in the fall. We have two weeks this spring to enjoy her company. And she is a visiting distinguished professor of women's gender and sexuality studies here, made possible by the Colleges of the Arts and Sciences, the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, the Women's Place, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I've got these great new names and I'm getting them down. <laughs> Our department just went through a name change, so it's like a lot of different name changes around the campus to reflect our kind of futuristic visions, right? And then also the Kerwin Institute. So all of us together are welcoming you. The Kerwin staff is here, staff. And all of you are invited by virtue of your relationships or understandings of the work of Kerwin. So we delight in having you here. Last fall, John uh, Powell, the director of the Kerwin Institute, and Belle engaged in a series of dialogues about identity and spirituality and the practice of diversity. How do our identities inform our diversity work? So Belle and I are going to continue that conversation in some ways by thinking about a particular focus of identity and thinking about the ways in which we talk so much about we can understand in our social justice work why race matters. But why does gender matter to race and how we construct and understand the meaning of race? So we have the world-renowned, author of more than 35 books, Bell Hooks, here to share with us. Okay, more classes. <laughs> of white supremacy 
and in re resistance struggle, anti-racist movement that to understand how this drama plays itself out in our world today, it is essential that we look at women, it's essential that we understand that race is gender. I believe that one of the most powerful aspects of contemporary feminist movement was the fact that it brought race and gender together. So I'm interested, and that's a part of what we're gonna talk about this morning, is all the new stuff that's trying to neatly separate race and gender and tell us um, that we don't really have to struggle as women to deal with our white supremacy and our relationships with one another because we're sisters of the yaya. <laughs> <laughs> we're the secret life of bees. So you're gonna hear me talk about how all of these like contemporary narratives, because you know, I read The Secret Life of Bees and I was too through at the end of it. And they started talking about, in that last couple of paragraphs, how ugly the black Madonna was. Okay, now here's the white woman. The black woman done saved your life, you know, rescued you from the situation of domestic violence, giving you a new vision of yourself. And then, in two paragraphs at the end of the book, you're gonna talk about how ugly we are. Isn't that deep? It is so deep to think about these narratives. So we're going to talk about the help. We're going to talk about silly movies like It's Complicated, you know, so that we can bring Hispanic women in too, how, you know, and we're going to talk really about re-mammification. Uh, okay. Well, let's start. <laughs> well, let's start with some of those examples so we can think about kind of you know, theoretically, we can say, oh, race is gender, but what does that mean in terms of how we play out life, real life examples that just make popular culture? And my area is politics, so I want to talk about the Obamas in terms of thinking about the ways in which race is gendered, both in terms of black masculinity and representations of black women. Well, have you sir, heard Michelle Obama say anything lately? She can't talk because she's too busy out in the garden harvesting those colored rings, you know? <laughs> and, organic, organic colored. Organic colored greens and telling us, fat black woman, get back. You know, I think Giovanni has that poem where she says, fat black woman, get back. I mean, I think it's, I, I want to find the serious passage here where I talk about how Michelle Obama, I find it interesting that at a time where the most well represented black woman in the world. Michelle Obama is a law professor. Um, you know, her professors believe that she would have been a much better candidate for president um, than anyone else, including Barack Obama. Why do we have, at this historical moment, this resurgence of white women talking about how much they love their maids, how much the maids love them. And when I talk about re I'm talking about the whole question of when black women get out of our place, when black women rise. See, let me tell you this, when black women rise, the whole world is shifting. You know, they've done all these studies to show that, like this room, that the, the individual who will most change the dynamic and atmosphere of this room is a dark-skinned black woman. Now, they didn't say a black woman, but I'm gonna say a dark-skinned black woman. Because you're when you're right. It's all about the what the people that have been designated the bottom. And it's about that bottom rising. So what happens when that bottom rises is remember that Michelle Obama gets quickly coded as we don't want you to be like Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So she has to assure people. You know, when Barack Obama lost me. When they ask him, you know, was she gonna be able to come to meetings and stuff? And, and he did his whole thing about how no. Um, and I thought, this is again the culture of domination. Why couldn't he say, well, Michelle Obama is a citizen like everyone else and has to, a right to offer her opinions about um, any aspect. And she's so incredibly smart. She might have brilliant insights but no, he had to tell people she would not be saying anything. And then all of a sudden, I have a lot of quotes here, but I won't, we can't find them, about her talking about herself as chief mom. So when we 
talk about remanification, we have to deal with why does she have to assure the whole U.S. of A. I won't be saying nothing. I won't be emasculating the black man in the White House. I will simply be taking care of food and children. And there's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to have a binary. We should celebrate effective, meaningful parenting. I'm all for organic gardening. But the idea that she has to close off all of those other parts of herself, and that she had to kind of, I know there's a graduate student here who's doing work on the maternal, and that she had to reinsert herself as the maternal figure, um, as I won't go outside that parameter of motherhood. I mean, I think the Obamas did a fascinating read of kind of what happened to Hillary Clinton, what happened to Teresa Hines Kelly, Kerry, in terms of moving through the campaign and the assaults on womanhood. But I think also this is a, a nugget of that that we have to take up in this conversation in terms of race. And I think we have to think about it both in terms of what we are able to receive as a public around what constitutes black womanhood. You know, we don't have a lot of examples of political black women moving through the political atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. So the notion of what we are able to receive in terms of a public Michelle Obama is quite different. And it's interesting too, I think, in terms of the differences between what, how the black community is viewing Michelle Obama as mom in chief. Because I think the sisters is, oh, absolutely. She gets to be the mom in chief. At last we get a chance to see an African American woman who gets a chance to care for her children and stay home. Because it's working in that concept of the old kind of respectability of black womanhood, right? in terms of how black women are receiving. Do you think it's a little different in terms of what black women, how they're responding to Michelle Obama as the mom and she's getting the privilege to guard me? <laughs> <laughs> her college <laughs> organic? Well, I think that you're absolutely right that we have the old model of mammy, which is mammy in the service of whiteness. So I think that there are a lot of black females who felt we have a black woman in the service of her family. And therefore, that you know changes a direction in our society. The problem with it is that it doesn't have to be the binary. It doesn't have to be either or. What if Barack Obama had said from the beginning that you know this is a brilliant woman and anything that she has to offer, and that she had said, you know, I'm still maintaining my astute political understandings, and at the same time, I want to make sure that I protect my children, of course, Belle would have loved for her to say, I I'm, I'm, want to protect my children in this imperialist white supremacist family. <laughs> I want to make sure that they are safe. And I want to be a model for other black women to see the, how we should protect and nurture and parent our children. So that, I mean, I think one of the big things about visionary feminism has been our efforts to argue against binaries, that it's not either or, that you don't have to choose between parenting and your career, but that you have to create new languages with which to talk about who you are. Um, you know, and I think that that was not allowed, that in fact the clampdown was, you know, we have to go through the old languages to make sure this black woman is not only in her place, but more profoundly that she's used to put white women in their place. You know, because I often say that sexism is the plantation that we as black people have been given now. It's like, you know, if you think about Chris Rock's um, Kill the Messenger, so you have a black man telling us, we can't have no black woman in the White House because she'd be trying to rule and blah, blah, blah. So there's a certain level of misogyny and anti-black woman sentiment, but it's coming through an anti-woman sentiment, but it's coming through the hip, cool, attractive black male so that people don't recognize it as the danger that it is. I think there was a moment, <clears throat> a moment in the campaign, right? Where we were seeing this kind of celebration of the egalitarian black marriage. And sociologists love and eat up the whole notion of black families being the vanguard of 
the egalitarian family, the egalitarian marriages in particular. So here we have, as you point out, this like equally talented couple who have these very amazing careers who are thrust into the spotlight. And at the moment in which we start to see these interviews with Michelle and Barack, and our barber over at the Kerwin Institute is really good about reminding of us of these pivotal moments mm -hmm. in which we see Michelle Obama you know, saying, well, he still needs to understand how to pick his towel up in the morning, and he's still you know, making these kinds of public corrections that immediately start to be read mm -hmm. as an emasculation. So you have this kind of black, you know, we got to talk about race as gender, we also have to talk about the masculine side, right? So you're dealing with the ways in which America also is attempting to or not attempting to read Barack Obama's black masculinity and how is he going to perform his black masculinity. So when she's even there doing it, oh, don't talk about the fist bump moment, okay. <laughs> right? Where we're like, oh yeah, you hit that one out of the park because I'm a co-creator mm -hmm. in this project. That is immediately the point where we start to see the media backlash against the whole concept or possibility of an egalitarian marriage. And we have the kind of, as you're saying, the re -manification. But I would take it further. It's okay. not egalitarian. The chick is smarter than he is. I mean, like, <laughs> this is what I think that many people have trouble processing um, is the whole question of what do, what do you do if, if it's not a sense that we're on this equal par, but that the woman, no matter what race she is, is somehow ahead in some way, that makes her even more dangerous. So she has to, be, you, you really have to push her back. You know, and I, I think about that in terms of myself, that in, in my, evidently I'm missing in action. I hear a lot of articles about me saying I'm missing in action and that's because I'm not in New York. But I can remember when I'd be in New York, come to New York and I'd meet black men um, and they would say, I would say, well, what's happening? And they could say, you're the man. And a lot of it had to do with the sense that the level at which I produced intellectually and my written work took me outside um, the realm of the feminine or the woman that you can even be equal with, it's like you've gone beyond. I, I was nurturing a black woman graduate student when I wrote Breaking the Bread with Cornell, and she called me one night and she said, she always called me mom. She was like, mom, you know, Cornell ain't gonna speak to you after this book is published. And I was like, why? Because it shows that you're smarter than he is, <laughs> that you think more deeply than he does because you think about race and gender and class and bring them together in ways that he does not. And I think that we haven't really been able as feminists to really talk about, uh, the, the real issue for visionary feminists isn't equality, it's mutuality. Because mutuality allows for the fact that I may in fact be better than you and you may be better than me at something, but that we can still have a mutually nourishing bond and I think that, that that whole paradigm of, you know, the sort of like the royal wedding, I mean, that in a way, this new royalty of blackness, it was all about Camelot. Yes, Camelot, but the man is gonna be in charge. And the woman is gonna be, you know, she'll be right close behind him, but she's gonna be behind him. And let's face it, a lot of black people felt a real sense of renewal with that image of, you know, the black woman being a little behind and relishing that role. The pedestal, the denied, the denied pedestal for black women and black women, would you say? Exactly, and the fact that, what, what, where is it that we articulate the reality of contemporary black women, a lot of the black women in this room, but we're not even seeking to be on pedestals. You know, that we're seeking to be in all areas of our life, proactive, productive, and growing and self-actualizing. So already the pedestal is an old model for many of us, but I think for black women who are low paid, who are working hard, who don't make enough to pay the rent, the pedestal still represents the possibility. Like I was with this beautiful young black woman, cocaine user, and she was telling, I was asking her, well, what do you want out of your life? And she was like, 
oh, I just want to stay, I want to be married, and I want to stay at home, and I want to have my children. And I was like, okay. Of course, she wants her big house, her fantastic car, Ferrari, or, or something like that. And I say to her, well, who do you know has that? I mean, do you look out in the world and you see a black woman? Well, the black females that she saw that have that are the girls that are involved with the big time drug dealers and they are able to live this certain kind of life. And it seemed to me such a sad um, notion of the pedestal because it's like, you know, Kimberly is teaching video Vixen and when you read it, I mean, in a sense, she uh, personifies that longing of younger black women to not have to enter the work world, to have some way out, but where you can have a kind of wealth that surrounds you, where you can feel that you, you're you in control, and that you have, we're back to we, the, the counterpoint to Mammy is pussy power. <laughs> that you're controlling the world with your pussy. Let me read a little so I can be more, you know, within the circles of this feminist movement, the aims of sisterhood were often realized. Within mainstream culture, however, it was sentimental notions of sisterhood that were represented and celebrated. Woman bonding was no longer in the interest of challenging and changing patriarchy. It was all reduced to personal intimacy. Books like The Color Purple, Paradise, Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, The Secret Life of Bees, and so on, offered images of a world of woman bonding in daily life that had no connection to organized political struggle. Many of the books and movies that purported to show a world of celebratory woman bonding ultimately reinforced the thinking and practices of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Now, how many of you all saw this movie, It's Complicated? Like, I see so many bad movies. <laughs> movies like It's Complicated, with the middle-aged white woman actress, Meryl Streep, as the long-suffering Jane, who is in long-term recovery from the breakup of her marriage to Jake, played by Alec Baldwin, so in this movie, the betraying, unfaithful Jake has left Jane 10 years ago for a younger wife who is darker skinned, beautiful, self-centered, and potentially dominating. Represented as sensual and exotic, she is the mother of a darker skinned boy, Pedro, who is depicted as Mr. Macho, ruling both his mother and stepfather. When Jane and Jake begin a sexual affair, a renewed sexual affair, she sits in a circle of her girlfriends, all white women like herself, and crows with triumph. She is the besting the younger woman through her betrayal. It is the perfect revenge. No mention, of course, is ever made of the younger woman's ethnicity, but it is clear that she does not share in the privileged whiteness that connects Jane and her circles of sisterhood. The message of the movie suggests that it's acceptable for white women to show allegiance and fierce loyalty to women like themselves while destroying the lives of women unlike themselves. So much for feminist solidarity. It's hard to decide which is more dangerous. The proliferation of books that pit white and black females against one another, or the many recent books which portray black females in the manny position, providing their lovely white grown up children with strategies for survival. <coughs> The recent successful publication of Catherine Stockett's book, The Help, is a perfect example of this trend. In an afterword at the end of the book, Stockett acknowledges that she was raised for a time by a black domestic, and she boldly announces in the back of the book, I was afraid I would fail to describe a relationship that was so intensely influential in my life, so loving, yet so grossly stereotyped in American history and literature. Despite this fear, her book is, a grossly, is as grossly <laughs> stereotypical as any fictional book in the history of American letters, which purports to give us the inside look into relationships between black, black domestics and the white families, the white women they serve. 
Continuing her self-praise in the afterward, Socket told readers that there is one sentence in the book that she prizes above all others. Her white female writer protagonist declares about her relationship to a black female, wasn't that the point of the book? For women to realize we are just two people, not that much separates us, not nearly as much as I thought. Needless to say, there's nothing that suggests that the writer of this amazingly successful first novel, you know, let's face it, the chick is a multimillionaire, right. has learned from feminist theory or from cultural critics who study the dynamics of race, gender, and representation. She need not interrogate her position, her values, her politics before she begins writing. Of course, as Richard Dyer highlights in his discussion of white privilege in the cultural treatise White, the reality is simply that white folks are not called to question the assumptions they make about the lives and voices of non-white others. Dyer explains, as long as whiteness is felt to be the human condition, then it alone both defines normality and fully inhabits it. The question and equation of being white and being human secures a position of power. White people have power and believe that they think, feel, and act like and for all people. White people, unable to see their particularity, cannot take account of other people's. White people create the dominant images of the world and don't quite see that they just construct the world in their own image. I think this passage was worth quoting at length because it illuminates the overall narcissism underlying the creation of Stockett's black characters, who speak in a dialect more suited to extreme periods of Jim Crow racial segregation than modern times. Many of the lines she uses, however, appear to be directly mimicking lines from Alice Walker's The Color Purple, which was certainly seen by many as a contemporary minstrel tale. So, <coughs> sorry that took so long. I love that you got that in. I'm from Jackson, where Catherine Sockett is from, and she based the story out of Jackson, Mississippi. And I know that for the black domestics in our community, her depiction the dialect is not reminiscent of the women that I know. It's not reminiscent of the stories they told of working in uh, white families' homes. And it wasn't the all-consuming nature that she takes on for put, puts in the place in the mouths of black women. Um, or I think about my mother who worked as a domestic and how her friends used to sit around and say, I haven't seen a white woman over the age of 12 that I can respect. I mean, I don't even think we have a language to really name the profound animosity, hatred, envy, all of those things that truly characterize the relationships of black and white women in this society. So that's why we wanted to think together about, given that harsh reality, given everything feminism did to call out that reality and to work to change it, why are these works suddenly so emotionally appealing and I mean, I have to tell you, the, the way they're functioning, my sister at her job in Flint, Michigan, was told by white coworkers, you have to read this wonderful book, The Help. So when she read it and she found it really offensive, she felt that she couldn't speak her disdain. And you all heard my story last time I was here when the white woman, women's studies person at my college wanted us, the whole college to read The Help and asked me and my other black woman colleagues what did we think and we said, you know, we didn't think that it was the type of book that needed to be read by everybody. And that in fact there were books like this book, Kimberly Wallace Sanders' book, Mammy, a century of race, gender, and Southern memory that really take a look at our construction of the black mammy. And as you know, um, she went ahead, she asked us what we thought, we said, well, we think this is a waste of time. Let's, let's really look at feminist scholarship that's looking at the relationship between black domestics and white women. So, of course, she went right ahead. And so Bell Hooks went right home and wrote her essay. And at the start of the year, I always give a big F, a talk. So I gave a big talk. And in my big talk, I talked about white women asking us what we think as black women, women of color, and then completely discounting what we say. And I said, you know, and of course I got to, I had to break it down and say, white women who have written no books, white women who have not fought <laughs> ably. So later, 
when I saw her in a restaurant and I spoke to her, she didn't speak to me. So I said, oh, this isn't Feminist Sisterhood Solidarity Day. This must be White Supremacy Day. <laughs> and she you know, came into my face with her hand and said, don't you dare. Don't you dare. You humiliated me in public. I'm not going to talk to you. And I will say, excuse me, did I call your name? If I really wanted to get you, I would have talked about you. I was talking about the huge numbers of white women that are reading the help and you.
of feminism <laughs> and what sisterhood could really be through these but kinds political, of But political. And political. Women who are determined to be radical and political at the individual level. <coughs> so what I want to ask you, how does that then, how do we replicate that in terms of a larger kind of societal, because not every, we can't pull everyone into friendship with their hooks. No, 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 or you're, you're misunderstanding me, Wendy. I'm actually talking, I'm not talking about friendship. I'm talking about the difference between women of all races who have made some kind of political commitment and therefore in changing and transforming their lives and women who are saying, well, we don't need to be political, we just need to get together and share. Oh, absolutely. Friendship can certainly be at the political, deeply engaged, let's do the work level. But, but I'm not I'm talking about, about friendship, Wendy. Well, you're talking about political <laughs> struggle that's grounded out of a relationship of knowing. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm talking about, <laughs> this is true, I'm talking about <laughs> coming to critical consciousness. And in, in classic political ways that many of us come to political consciousness and therefore transform our lives, and yes, it may then transform our personal friendships, but I'm contrasting about political choice with the idea that women don't need to be political. We've already arrived at sisterhood, and that's what, and, I, and notice that I'm including Alice Walker and other black women who write certain kinds of sentimental novels in this, the idea that, because I've always been disturbed by the fact that the most political black woman in The Color Purple is crushed, um, suffers, um, is not a winner in that book. And that her struggle to be political is contrast with those who are making personal tr transformation, which is, is, you know, which is kind of personal self-help transformation, but not in resistance struggle, not in political. Let's open this up and see. Um, did, did that distinction become clear, though, that I'm wanting to make a distinction between that political consciousness and a sentimentally based notion of solidarity that I think books like the Yaya Sisters, I mean, they create that for white women too, and The Secret Life of Bees. Like, we don't have to talk about race or inequality or positionality. We can just love each other. Right, and the way in which you've been able to push against that is in these kinds of concentrated conversations. I guess what the question that I really want to ask you about that is how do we then galvanize a conversation that's broader since the help, since these eat, pray, love, all of these novels are commanding so much attention and God help us when the help is on the big screen. Right? Because it's coming, it's been contracted, it's, it's in production. So how do we then it's done. engage? It's done. It's, done. it's, done. it's, it's done. out in the can it's just, okay, out in August. August. A popular culture. <laughs> so how do we, so when this gets magnified on the big screen as this is what we need to do is just all get in and love, how do we then rally a response to that at the macro level that's beyond kind of the ways in which we can engage in these individual conversations that walk us through how to get there? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, when was the last time we as black people went and stood out in front of movie theaters with our allies in struggle and saying, said, this is not what we want to see? What work will you give, give that counter-hegemonic critical voice through the boycott, through the use of protest? It's like all of that's over with. Mm -hmm. You know, why would you bother? You have all these black people saying, how much they like the help? <laughs> and after all, those black women actors were getting jobs and getting well paid, and you know. So it is about finances, you know. For and it's also about. I mean, I think people are in these states of longing to be able to feel connected without having to do the dirty work. You know, I mean, and I would say the same thing is going on in male-female relationships that people want to bypass the work of critical consciousness and challenge, and just like, let's be close. You know, um, you know let, let's uh, work out who's gonna do the chores, but let's really not talk about patriarchy. Because I do believe that underlying all of this, I have to give, because I was very proud of the young white women of bitch who um, 
writing, whether fiction or nonfiction, which centers on the lives of women while pushing narratives that are essentially anti-feminist, narratives which are most often marked by marketed by patriarchal male marketing and reviewing collude with anti-feminist backlash. I love it when Elizabeth Gilbert says in Eat, Pray, Love that she has no nostalgia for patriarchy. Please believe me. What I've one come to realize is that now that patriarchy is rightfully dismantled, it has not been replaced by another form of protection. Comments like this help add to the popular fantasy that patriarchy has ended and there's really no need for feminist movement. In their brilliant critique of Gilbert's book, Shoshana Sanders and Diana Barnes Brown explain, it's no secret that according to America's marketing machine, we're living in a post-feminist world where what many people mean by empowerment is the power to spend their own money. Such marketing and the women who buy into it assumes the work of feminism is largely done. This perspective makes it easy for the anti-feminism embedded in the wellness jargon of privilege to gain momentum because this anti-feminism is often hidden. It's an easy sell. So we should open up now. Come on, Rebecca, what are you thinking? <laughs> Rebecca's writing an essay on the health. Well, you know, you just... Uh... Don't even say it. Say what? Ah. Well, because you know I have different feelings about sentimentality. So. Well, say, say some of your different feelings. No, no, I don't need to. This is for other people. <laughs> so it's fine. Well, now we're all puzzled. I want them to know what those different <laughs> feelings about sentimentality. Just say a little. All right. Uh, I think that it's really hard to find a social protest movement in the history of this country that has not depended on appealing to the emotions and sympathy. Did you all hear that? That it's hard to find a social protest movement in this country that has not appealed to emotions. And sympathy. And um, sympathy. So, and it, it comes out of sort of this larger, particularly being the US and out of a particular kind of liberal individualist context that's, that's deeply connected to citizenship. So, while it is true, the problem with sentimentality is that then it depends on intimacy as an end. Um, but I do think it's often a piece. And so what's more interesting to me is these attempts to negotiate. Like the reason some, like, black people, or people can end up involved in projects that, that aren't as politically revolutionary as we might like is often because they're taking emotional comfort, getting, they're sustained emotionally in certain ways by parts of it, while there are other more radical political possibilities they're eschewing in favor of the comfort. Mm -hmm. And part of what is involved in some of our political projects is trying to figure out how to negotiate that tension between the, the desire for sympathy, for intimate connection, in relationship to more radical political possibilities that aren't as safe. Well, actually, I totally agree on a certain level, and I, I do have a whole thing that where I say what's positive about the help, what I believe is positive about a lot of this work, is that it does indicate widespread collective desire on the part of black women and white women and women of color and white women to find spaces of connection. And I don't want to belittle that. I think that, that that could possibly be a ground for the growth of critical consciousness if it were taken in a different direction. So I do try to talk about what, is, what if any, are there the positives in this trend? But on what terms? I guess that's- Your name. Question. Go ahead, Kate. So um, I guess the question is on what terms. And, and if you're going to have a collective space where people are coming from different places together, I'm taking one step. You're, I'm asking you to take five. That's not, that's not me. We're meeting on a collective level, but at what price? So I guess that's the question. I mean, it, it feels like the price is higher for an individual such as yourself than it might be for myself. Absolutely. I think the high price is higher for every woman of color, black woman in this room. And that's why we tire and stress <laughs> and don't feel good. That's why I told a little young black woman in Kimberly's class that I go to therapy and they said, why? Aren't you strong enough uh, to deal with your issues? And I was like, oh, so when you're having a heart attack, you don't want me to call a doctor. You want me to say, aren't you strong enough? Um, and I said the same goes true when we have emotional heart attacks um, that we may seek someone more skilled to help us. How do we fix that then? How, how do I, how, how? Here, here I'm asking the black woman for her opinion. 
Well, don't worry, the black woman ain't gonna answer you. I'm gonna ask, <laughs> I mean, what are some of the white women who I know are very fully aware out here? I think Kate's question is very relevant. How do we, basically we're saying, how do we create mutuality in a context that is so profoundly unequal to start with? So, Janet. Well, I think you hit on it when you talk about, I mean, I love Richard Dyer's work because he's so clear about the dynamics of guilt and narcissism in whiteness. And I think for, for white women, those dynamics are all the worse because we're trapped in the sentimental as the space of the feminine. So that that white colleague came to you and was like, I need to be forgiven. That's, the, that's our main dynamic. Guilt, guilt, guilt. Oh, I screwed up. I guilt. And then maybe a little shame, but mostly guilt. And then you're the only one who can forgive us. We have to get over that stuff. Yeah. And we have to work through what those dynamics are about because they're fundamentally about this narcissistic mm -hmm. whiteness that's trapped in our own emotional field in a way that we can't get out of, but we're universalizing it. And so the re mammification is about just helping us through our guilt. And we need to deal with our guilt ourselves. Yeah. Well, helping us too with our guilt, but we don't have to surrender any privilege. Yeah. Because I think, hey, what you're talking about is if we're going to do this, <coughs> on some kind of ground of, of commonality. You know, there, the fact is, there isn't any profound change that doesn't require of all of us to give up some degree of privilege. And I think that what most of us find, and these to me, I mean, when I wrote Yearning, I was really interested in, I'm interested in common emotions that people share. And I feel like the common emotion in imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy is, I don't want to give up anything, you know? And I, don't, I think that cuts across race and class in our society right now, that the, the overall mood of people is, why should I have to give up anything? You know, and I find in myself, Miss Giver, that the older I get, the more I don't want to give. The more I think, okay, go ahead, Lindy. I'm sorry. I was asking you this, do you think that the economic moment ever where people have been forced not necessarily to give it up, but it's just gone across, you know, of course we can talk about the ways in which communities of color have been out front and have given and been, as our newly minted PhD talked about, slowly armed robbed through the communities <laughs> of color in terms of stripping of wealth. But there's a moment in which people are now perhaps maybe not as cloaked in some of the traditional realms of their privilege? Does this provide a moment of opening where we can create shared stories around want, <laughs> around absence of? I can't answer that because I don't see that. I mean, I'm in the Appalachia. Somebody just, you know, they just stole my air conditioning units for the copper wiring. I mean, I'm talking about those big, heavy units. They had to bring a truck. It had to be more than one person. And in Appalachia, what we see is not a coming together around the incredible poverty and suffering and addiction that's a part of that, but actually further estrangement. I mean, I'm ready to sell my little place because I know that my working class white neighbors had to see the big truck, had to see the people loading up my two air handlers. And I felt that this was kind of a statement, and here I've been in this place, people have been very friendly to me, but when the chips are down, where is the solidarity? Does their solidarity lie with me, as in we'll tell you who robbed you, or does the solidarity lie with whiteness? Which is, we understand how white people are suffering, and you black woman with your four cars and your houses, and you know, like the white man stopping, uh, are you that color lady? that has that house on the hill, because we want to hunt on your property. But we heard you was in Paris, and then we heard you were in New York. And you know, because when you live in a little town, and they went into all these different cities, and there's something laughable about that, but it's also about class, and it's about saying, we don't identify with you, because you have this level of mobility, where you're moving all around, we can't even catch up with you we can get your air handlers. And then I was asking somebody, my neighbors were robbed, brutally, who I live in this country some of the time. And I was told that, oh, you weren't robbed, my keeper of my property said, because we have to chain 
fence. And then when I went into the on the download community, they was like, are you kidding? That chain fence was nothing. You weren't robbed because when the robbers went up into your house and looked in the mirror, they said, this chick don't have shit. Because <laughs> I don't have anything. You know, like I keep these like really sparse um, interiors where you can, and I never have curtains. So you can look in and see there's just a rug and the Buddha and there's no computer, no TV, no guns and knives. All the things that they took, all these different artifacts and things that they took from my neighbors. So I think that I don't see, I mean, this is very troubling uh, because what I see is the division more and more into categories. I mean, like the little town I live in has been dubbed by Ugly Reader, you know, the best town to be, the best place to be in the oncoming uh, tragedies of economics. And Jenny, you were trying to say something? Oh, I, I don't know. It was something you were saying earlier. It seemed to me that the dichotomy. Louder, you ladies. It just seemed to me that the dichotomy we were setting up early about sentimentality versus politics, uh, that kind of thing, I was just thinking that it seemed to me that these books that you're speaking of and the Eat, Pray, Love and the films, that the sentimentality is about the indulgence of having an appropriate identity crisis, is crisis versus and who has the voice to be able to have an identity crisis versus a politics of necessity, right? That the people coming to the table because they need to, it's about their life survival and about not about a, a, a momentary or a midlife, like eat, pray, love, midlife crisis. And so it seemed like a completely uneven um, connection. So to say, so that, that just something that came but to again, mind. But again, though, we could say the commonality is all of us have moments of crisis. All of us have. Right, but on that point, the <coughs> white people have midlife crisis, and then people of color, color they have sociologically designated problems, right? We have right, poverty, we, we have, right? But within it's our lives, we don't privilege. say, I'm having a sociological <laughs> <laughs> I say, I'm Wendy, trying to make it. I say, Wendy, my life has been really fucked up since I saw you last. <laughs> I made some really bad choices. Um, and so I think that But that's not how they're represented. Well, that's, a, but see, that's the whole struggle, isn't mm -hmm. it, in terms of decolonization. When, if ever, with our, will our representations of ourselves be able to take precedence over our representation by dominator culture? And I, I think that, that the mood that so many people of color feel is despair because, okay, I have to talk for a minute about the Malcolm X biography because it was so troubling on all levels. First of all, the cover is troubling, how retarded Malcolm looks on the cover. And I can tell you right now, white people decided that cover. That no black people decided, okay, we're gonna have a retarded looking Malcolm X on the cover, looking like he's giving the Nazi salute. I've been you know, reading what I found was the tedious and boring biography that didn't have any great revelations. Um, and I was thinking about, but, it, but its big thing is to tell us that Malcolm was by and large an imposter, that he was a liar, a betrayer, stingy, not even capable of being sexually fulfilling to the white, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question I've been asking myself is why at this historical moment, I was thinking about the question <coughs> of race and gender and manhood, that, you know, Ossie Davis, remember in, the, in his eulogy said, he was our manhood, he was our prince, our shining black prince. And what does it mean that in this 2011, we have a radical left black male scholar sort of unmasking our shining black prince and telling us he couldn't get it up on so many levels. Um, when Malcolm has really served for many of us, the autobiography of Malcolm X, the whole study of Malcolm X, you know, when I was 18, that was the beginning of a certain kind of critical consciousness for me. But it's mainly young people and especially young people of color who really try to grow into their critical consciousness from Malcolm. So I've been thinking about why is it so important to divest him of uh, who he is. And when Rebecca and Kimberly and I were at lunch, we were talking about him as a mythic figure, and we were like, well, why is it important to destroy the myth? If the myth serves to help us gain critical consciousness and why? Because remember that when books are published and who decides they get reviewed, 
Like the whole world of focus on this book is a white male dominated world. It's not like black people are sitting up saying, oh, we need everybody to read this book about Malcolm. We need to tell everybody about it because we don't have that marketing force. So once again, we see, I see this as a gendered narrative happening at an interesting moment where Obama, who was, you know, who had no manhood, who wasn't our shiny black prince, but now that he's, quote, killed bin Laden, he is the shining black prince, or the shining prince, and his manhood is no longer in question. But you it know? is in question. It is in question. The fact that he would not, the whole call to release these photos and to need this kind of proof, and in other parts of the world, the need for proof is operating a little bit differently. But I'm talking about the need for proof that's coming out of the US Congress, the demand for the need for proof, is ultimately a question of that masculinity. And this decision not to release the photos is an opportunity to have a different type, he's talked about it, right? A different type of masculinity performed on the big stage, right? A masculinity that does not require me to spike it, as he said, spike it in your face. Yeah. Spike oh, it to take the victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> to take the victory lap around in terms of what it means to have made this great feat realized, right? And it's in direct contrast to a George W. Bush mission accomplished mega hyper masculinity moment. But we can almost mark it to the date. Wasn't that cool on the calendar? That you could circle, <coughs> circle this on the calendar from day to day in terms of tracing the developments. But isn't it interesting that even in that moment of attempting to shift what it means to be masculine, right? In terms of not the need to, you know, take the head and put it on a platter and let's talk about it and see it and show it to our children and talk about our talk to our children about how to be good and peerless, right? But you didn't have to do that and still the question of his masculinity is at the forefront of our conversation. He had to show his birth certificate even. Yeah. <laughs> well, the birth certificate is about, I think, is about notions of who belongs, yeah. what is citizenship. Yeah, but it's all about documenting. It's like he has to like, you know, and it's still not enough every to step. And it's still not I, enough. I, I find everything you said compelling, but I do think that to me both of them are discourses of the heteronormative and that you, we, can't, we can't just have that binary life because we have to see that if the first thing he does is claim that patriarchal hypermasculine. And then he moves into the disclaimer of it. Like, okay, and, and, and again, and, and then, okay, then we have to then recode him as the feminine because he tries to please everybody. It's like all of you who needed the hyper-masculine lynching that we can celebrate, you can take your body part pieces home, and especially if you get the photos, you can have your trophies as in the traditional lynchings when black people, then are you trying to say something? Go oh, ahead. At what point do we stop assigning good to this hyper masculinity? Why, if the Navy SEALs had it so undercover, did they have to kill Bin Laden? Why not capture him, bring him in? Now that to me would speak to a new kind of masculinity. But I think where Obama trips up is he wants to have it both ways. And I think the inability to then um, meet the uh, negative attitudes of whites when he now wants not to give up the photos should alert him that mm, there's something more complicated here. It's really related back to your issue of sentimentality and politi the political. They're one and the same. It's just the arena in which they're articulated. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, so, also, I, don't, I think that I'm willing to say that there's a distinction between the sentimental and general emotional feeling and empathy, and that one can't equate the two, because I was thinking about uh, what I was thinking comments, of sentimentality as a more authentic enterprise, but you're absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Well, I was thinking about the kinds of emotions that did drive parts of the civil rights movement. I was thinking, I am particularly constantly renewed and moved by remembering Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, uh, those young men who gave their lives and who believed, and it was about a politics of passion. 
Um, I mean, if you read in the paper today about the Freedom Riders and people remembering and remembering the older black woman who's saying that she was afraid that she would die, but that she felt that she had to um, take this stand. And I think that that, that that kind of emotional energy that was driving so much of the struggle for civil rights is really why we, are, we can be here today. And so it was not sentimental, it was concrete, and it was, it was not dishonest, because it had a price um, that was very different. I mean, think about, I mean, don't you think it's interesting that the white women were telling us how uh, much they love the black women, but they're the ones who are getting rich, and not the, they're not sharing the wealth. I mean, I, I think the other paper that I've written is on Henrietta um, Black, and uh, Scoot's book, and how, how once again, I mean, the issue that I find interesting is these are very privileged young white women, they're in their early 30s, writing these narratives of black women's lives as though feminism never existed, as though a civil rights movement never existed. <coughs> and like, for example, in uh, Henrietta Lack's story, um, there's this whole passage where, um, She's talking about how she was staying in the bedroom with her cousins and these other people, and oh, she just ended up pregnant. And she makes it seem like, well, this was just normal fun they were having in this room, and she got pregnant. And it's sort of a scripting of the, the, all the stereotypes of black female body and life that, you know, getting, we're, we're not the victims of abuse or trauma. Instead, we're just these people who are having a good time and end up pregnant at you know, 15 or 16 or whatever. So I, I think that, I mean, I find it really interesting about the, the notion of taking black women out of history, that is, out of civil rights struggle, out of um, a politics that I think those of us who are race women always read our gender into a politics of struggle. Well, thank goodness for those feminist, black feminist historians who have done this incredible work of reclaiming those stories. I was thinking about the Freedom Riders 50th anniversary and PBS is doing the big splash of, of and watch the documentary and just even go online and look at the trailers. It is absolutely an incredibly moving documentary. But one of the things that I was like cheering about is that Diane Nash's story, who was one of the organizers of the Freedom Riders, a college student in Nashville. Yes. When we first started to talk about the Freedom Riders, her story was not at the forefront. You go, Wendy. You I just talked to me. But it's because of the amazing, the amazing work of black feminist scholars who were determined to think about how we can turn a different gaze on the civil rights movement that we even can document in its 50th anniversary that Di Nick, Diane Nash was one of the major leaders and she gets highlighted. And we get to hear her voice in this new retelling of the Freedom Riders. Whereas when we were going through the moment, her voice was totally silenced, erased, not conceived of as leadership that couldn't be within the domain of black womanhood. Well, I mean, but that's just to have the Oh, that, but that, I wanted to say, but that's why my passion for feminism is as intense as it was when I made my commitment to feminism as a, a 16 year old. Your name? Um, Lee, um, my question was regarding the Obama comment. Isn't the way we perceive President Obama and Michelle Obama really cultural hegemony? It seems like society will only allow him within the parameter to be so masculine because he's black. It, be, it teeters on, now you're being too black, where you have to walk this fine line. And it seems like with Michelle, it's the same way, or you're mama slash butch, or you are, you, you know. Or right she's in, the right real the black, middle. and he's the imposter black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but is that, but is that, I mean, we all, you can't say what I want to say, but Why? it seems to be, but it seems like black men have to walk a fine line between I am professional and prominent, or niggerish, or mm. professional and prominent and feminine, and I'm too feminine. So when he, it seems to me when he presents himself, where he said he needs to be, you know, more like a man, more like a man, 
but then in society, that's portrayed, regardless if you have a suit on, you're, you're ghetto. So I don't agree with some of the, the imposter or with the, is he really emasculating himself? Is he really putting himself in a position? Because when you're seen through popular eyes, when you're in a position of power, it, it, it teeters on that line. It's like you have to be asexual if you're in a, in a position and a minority. It's interesting because in Kimberly's class uh, yesterday, the students were saying that Oprah was asexual. And I'm still meditating on that, that whole, and I actually was later talking about, well, if you're gonna be mammy to the world, you can't have a sex life. Uh, so you're too busy pulling out the tick. I mean, so where would you have time? Okay, that's right. I mean, but that's interesting, isn't it? To think about that whole, the whole idea of a black woman who is single, childless, but perceived, again, we're back to that paternal you know, representation that she's the mother of the world. And I, you know, um, Amanda's doing her work around this whole maternal stuff. I was thinking about the hostility that I have met with from other feminists because I'm not big on the mother tip. I don't want to think about the earth as my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time I was like giving a talk with Vandana Shiva, you know, people were really upset and booed me when I said, I'd rather think of the earth as my cousin or my uncle, or, I mean, why is it that we have to fall back on the evocation of the mother to talk about sustainability, eco-feminism? Well, because as long as we do that, we just arrive always back at this sort of binary of women hold certain values because we are biologically female, um, that we value more, and so we're back to a kind of evocation. And, but I find it interesting that people don't want to let it go. And is it that, I mean, I, I just read a book that Hazel loaned me called Love and Power, um, Creating Social Change. I, I got the subtitle a little long by Adam Kahani. And it was, to me, a really amazing book because he talked about the difference between power over and power to using an amazing quote by Martin Luther King that I'd never heard before about the whole idea of, of power as energy and how we use it. But I think that part of what we, we recognize is how reluctant people are to change the paradigms by which we, and, and including feminists on some of them. I mean, I think feminists were among those on one hand who disparaged the mother, but then we went on to re-fetishize the mother uh, in our ever gender war that we are somehow emotionally superior to the male. Um, but anyway, another question. Your name? Erin. I think often when we talk about black women in particular, we talk about her relationship to men and how, they, how women have to step back. But I think what's missing is when a black woman's relationship to another woman and balancing that, that sense of power. And then even with black women and white women, um, like my partner, white woman, and we've had to work through even styles of communication and what that means and being egalitarian and, and, and all of that. I think that, that comes out, it doesn't get included in the conversation a lot about roles and gender and race. But don't you think that that's exactly why we want to depoliticize that connection? That we don't want to talk about the fact that you may come together with a white woman in love, but that you still have concrete practices that have to take place that make it possible for that love not to fall into domination mm -hmm. or into, and, and I think that that's the thing that people don't want to have to deal with that level of rigor in the world of relationships. I mean, people want to believe that if we do go shopping together, you know, the, the issue of how we perceive the world, how we talk about the world, is not going to be, um, Exactly. Defining the relationship. And or, relationship. you know, that we can change it the way we want, you know, um, to. That if a white woman calls me a nigger but she likes me, I have to see that her nigger doesn't mean the same. Uh, <laughs> as the historical nigger man. You know, I mean, I, I mean we're, talk, we're acting like these things don't occur, but they do. I mean, we were talking yesterday 
um, in my seminar about the whole question of the fate of men in our society who look like the image of Bin Laden as they go about daily life. And one of the gay men of color in the class was saying that he has sex with white men who then say to me, him, you know, fuck me like a terrorist, you know, blow up my ass, you know, like all of, all of these kind of uh, languages of uh, political, political language that then is used in this context of, quote, intimacy that would, would presume a kind of consensual level of equality, but that verbalization then totally disrupts what could be the... Because that could be the end of the action. <laughs> that you 
people walk in versus me and testers have done work on this in terms of thinking about kind of how does white supremacy manifest itself in the banking industry. And it's more likely that with my great credentials, my great credit, my work here at The Ohio State University, the initial loan that's going to be pitched to me, and again, my colleague has been doing some wonderful work in this area, the initial loan that will be pitched to me is going to have terms that are much more derogatory than the person who comes in in the embodiment of a white, first as white, then as a white woman is likely to do better. And then as a white man is likely to be best, do best in terms of the type of loan that they're going to be extended. The person walking in had nothing to do with it. They looked at the neighborhood I'm trying to buy the house in. They looked at what kind of car I think I want to drive. They looked at all of these other things. And they looked at what they think other people who look like me are interested in doing. And they say, that's a default in the making. We got to put some risk, some security around that. Whereas on the other side, you're very much like me. I understand your choices. Your values line up with my values, even though I've not had a conversation with you whatsoever. I'm just sizing it up. And that is how white supremacy gets institutionalized and in the structure of our society, where we don't have to think about it being individual perpetrators anymore. Well, uh, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, you know, <laughs> in, terms of our, in terms of how kind of these dogs. Okay, but I have to tell my cute little story because I know y'all want to hear it. I just bought a condo. <laughs> I just have one more question. Okay, but I just bought a condo. And, you know, you have to meet with the association, so I'm being interviewed by white men. And they say to me, We have Googled you. And we see that you wrote a book called Killing Rage, where you express anger towards white men. And we want to know, do you still have that anger? <laughs> <laughs> and as I was going, talking about the question of who has voice, in my mind, I'm thinking, hell yeah, I I'm feeling it right now. So, you haven't asked any white people and Googled them about how they feel about people of color. But instead, I smiled and said, oh, that wasn't real. That was just symbolic, <laughs> you know? And then when they accepted me into the association, they said, by the way, you will be the first. Yeah. So now for many of us, we would see all kind of narratives of white supremacy in that action and race and gender. Because the question is, if I had been a black male and they saw that rage, would I have been able to play it off? But it's just symbolic. <laughs> You know, it doesn't have meaning, uh, you know, whereas being a female with a little Betty Boop type voice, you know, to what extent does that allow me then to discount my own very powerful political voice in the interest of um, getting into the all white uh, condo place? I think you need to throw a real black party at your new condo. <laughs> yeah. Real black house, house But my point is, in all of that, white supremacy is operating, but it's not operating as any kind of brutalizing, covert force. And in fact, we would, I would go so far as to say that the white men who hugged me and welcomed me into the association actually feel that they did something groundbreaking and positive. And I think this is one of the things that I came up with a couple years ago was the whole question of multiple intentionalities. Because on one hand, there was this weird interrogation around race, but on the other hand, these are liberal people who really saw this as a moment for them to show um, their willingness to be inclusive, and I think this is part of why it's so hard for us to talk about domination, because it isn't a simple thing of uh, the Ku Klux Klan burning a cross in your yard, that it can be the person that's having sex with you, but saying all manner of incredibly hostile and racist things, and how do we deal with that? And I think this is why partially as a nation, we don't want to deal with it, because it's complex. It's not simple. We could also talk about me. Why do I want to live in this association? 
you know, instead of the really rich, beautiful white neighborhood that I already live in, where people stick their dogs on me every day, I have this real fear of dogs. And one thing about my association is that they allow no pets. And so I'm very happy to be where I can walk. But think about that, uh, those multiple intentionalities, my own intentionalities, you know, which have to do with health and wanting to exercise, but not where I'm confronted with people's dogs. My neighborhood, super liberal, that I'm in already is actually wonderful, but everybody has super militant hateful dogs. And <laughs> <laughs> somehow I've been trained to eat black people. <laughs> okay, one last, 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 last. Um, It's not really a question per se, a comment and asking on your advice, because right now I'm working towards creating a, like a dialogue course for black women, discussing the issues that we face on campus and opening up the dialogue, not just for black women, but for the greater uh, community to come, be a part of this course, also get credit because we're students, but to have this discourse about what it means to be a minority woman going to a majority white school, and the, basically being a woman and being a minority, and like the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis, like the little things you're talking about, and how would you suggest creating this dialogue and creating a space wherein we can have a dialogue without having the outside paradigm of this white supremacist idea leaking in or without having people being afraid to confront these issues that we all talk about every day? I think you gotta march right through it. Exactly. Because it's always there. Yeah. It's always there. So if you create this, you know, imaginary confined space where white supremacy can't come in, as soon as you open the door, whoo, there she is, he is, it is. Um, so I don't know, I think you have to march right through it. I think that's where the critical consciousness and engagement um, that Bell's been talking about comes into play. That Those are the types of spaces that are extremely, the possibilities of creating that type of critical consciousness come into existence in those small spaces. So is I gotta have this brother which, ask his question. Oh, well, there, there have been a couple Your of things. My name is Michael. There have been a number of things that have come out to me in this discourse today. Uh, one of them is constructs, um, structural constructs, be it uh, white supremacy, be it the institution of the presidency. <coughs> uh, one of the things that I think that uh, we didn't really give enough credence to, the idea that uh, there is a extraordinary sacrifice that comes with the institution of the presidency, mm -hmm. one that requires uh, you to embrace patriarchy, one that requires you to adopt a more nationalist uh, ideology that not only considers you, your, your own personal values, um, I think some people show themselves more principle-centered than others, but uh, that also, ex you know, kind of absorbs and, 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 and oversees the, the expectations of a country, of a nation. Um, of a nation as complex as ours with our types of issues. Um, you talked about, you know, pussy power or what I would call vaginal virulence for this audience. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I, I, I like that concept from, 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 many, from many instances. I, I think that there's a strong validity into it. I think that our, our, our popular culture has too much embraced sexual behavior sexual behavior that I think is very scientific and very biological, sexual behavior that precipitates our biological longevity, a behavior that we use to engage each other, to reproduce, to procreate. We have accepted so much of that without really embracing all the, to the, the totality of who we are as human beings, of who we are as men and women. Um, I love you. I do. I love your rawness. I, I, I love your energy. <laughs> but the one thing, <laughs> but I, I, I think the, the one thing that I really would challenge us to think more thoroughly on and, and, and more cross-cutting on is how do we cultivate our relationships with each other? This is my wife. Um, we're in business together. There's a love language and there's a business language. And often we find <laughs> conflict and headlocking in that kind of communication. Uh, there are other kinds of constructs in communication, how we try to figure, each other, figure ourselves out as men and women. I would like to have more of that conversation. Oh, I, I, I would too. I'll close with this too. <laughs> there, was this, there was this question about, you know, how do we 
you know, use our, our, our abilities, our influence, this kind of way of thinking about life um, to change it, to change things, become, you know, affective. Um, I think the way to do that, and this is the other word that came out to me, power and voice, the way to do that is to give power away, not hold on to it, not hold on to this feminine strength and power, celebrate it with me, celebrate it with me. I, I, my, my wife is a, an extraordinarily strong woman, and she has many talents and abilities that I don't have. You know, okay. But, the last thing is this. There's a, there's a leadership intelligence. A leadership intelligence. Well, I think that we you would talk like this book, um, Power and Love, because it talks about that. But let me say this just because this is one of the things I love about coming to the Hale Cultural Center, and I want to thank um, the director and everybody is that when I come here, I can bring all my languages, mm -hmm. the languages of black vernacular, the language of the black South of which um, I have, and the language of being intellectual. And that is one of the great things about having this particular institution uh, here at Ohio State, um, that I can bring that holistic self here and I want to end by saying that those of you who haven't been to the Cultural Center before must recognize the role of humor in critical consciousness and in changing our efforts to change. Because many times when we are dealing with the politics of difference, um, humor is, is part of what allows us to have moments of release and pleasure. And I want to thank Wendy for all her efforts.